Okay, Susan Schnall, New York City Veterans for Peace, Thomas Dwyer, John Mar Maragliano, uh, and Tarak Kauf. Good afternoon. My name is Susan Schnall. I am currently president of New York City Veterans for Peace. I'm also an adjunct professor at New York University and a member of the New York City Pension Fund, for I worked for the New York City Public Hospitals for over 31 years. Fifty years ago, I served this country as a nurse in the United States Navy, caring for the wounded who came home from war in Southeast Asia. I also protested United States involvement in that war and was court-martialed for my peace activities. Like many of us in Veterans for Peace, I've witnessed the pain, the horror of war, the destruction, the use of bombs, the use of chemical defoliants, the harm caused by our military and our government. Today, I am testifying in support of Resolution 976 and Intro 1621. Veterans for Peace is a member of the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. These represent organizations in 100 countries promoting adherence to and implementation of the United Nations Nuclear Weapon Ban Treaty. As a member of this coalition, Veterans for Peace is dedicated to pressuring the United States government to sign the treaty. For over three weeks in October 2019, I was on a peace trip to Japan, speaking to civil society organizations, academics, United States Navy, Japan Self-Defense Forces, and school children to apologize for my government having dropped nuclear weapons on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Today, I come before the New York City Council and thank you for sponsoring these resolutions and introduction. I come in support to make New York City a nuclear-free city, as well as in support of Intro 1621, divestment of New York City pension funds currently invested in companies involved in nuclear weapons, and nuclear weapons production, and maintenance, for as I said, I'm also a member of the pension fund in New York City. The corporations manufacturing nuclear weapons are fueling the nuclear arms race for their own financial gain. They actively lobby their governments and their parliaments to continue allocating funds for nuclear weapons and they support their think tanks and other public initiatives to promote the, quote, need for nuclear weapons maintenance, moderate modernization, or expansion. Can you just wrap up? I am. Okay. We must become a life-affirming society instead of a death-enhancing culture. It is our responsibility, all of us, as citizens of the world who reside in New York City, to make our voices heard, to make our city and continue it as a nuclear-free zone. We thank you, our elected representatives, for hearing us to attempt to divest from those nuclear companies that make their profits on death and destruction. We thank you for listening to the people of New York City, to listening to us veterans who have served this country and request that we divest from nuclear production industries. Thank you all for hearing us. Thank you. Next, please. 
Hi there, my name is John Marigliano. They call me Johnny Brooklyn or Johnny Skates. Uh, I am a lifelong Teamster uh, member and I, I work for Local 814. I'm a foreman with Globe Storage and Moving. And I overheard that this meeting was happening at a party and was compelled to come because something has been bothering me for 30 years. I worked in the Baker and Williams warehouse for Globe. We leased that space for probably about 15 years in the late 80s and early 90s until they forced us out of our lease. How many times I was on the floor, on the floors of the building, at some floors you could actually see the train tracks where the High Line now exists. And w there were barrels everywhere, and we always wondered what was in those barrels. And the, f the floor was made up of asphalt that, like it was on the street. And the ba wherever the barrels sit, there was a big ring. There was warmth radiating from these barrels. And, there was, and even it was actually melted around. The, the asphalt was actually melted around the, the barrels. My boss was given a bonus to get, the, to get us out of that building. Six, if we could get out six months early, something was wrong, and we knew something was wrong for them to force us out that quickly. I have always wondered about the cancers that some of our members got, about what happened, what the future is, what those people walking on the High Line now, what the people that are in the galleries that are there now, how that neighborhood has changed so much, but still there are people that live there, there are human beings in this city that are exposed to things that they shouldn't be exposed to, and we cannot, I, I hope that you will pass this so that we can, that, that nobody is put in danger again like that. There were, I didn't work there enough to, to be exposed in that way, or at least I don't think so, I don't know yet, but I, I'll never never know what happened to some of them, some of those men and if that was a cost if that was part of it so thank you for listening thank you for that thank you very much next please hi my name is Tom Dwyer I'm a retired insurance executive I've worked in the Wall Street uh, financial or the financial district of Manhattan all my working uh, years and I uh, just love New York and uh, I'm delighted to be at this hearing. Uh, I owe my presence here really to um, Anthony uh, Donovan, who's here tonight and um, uh, is, w is connected with the Catholic Workers Movement. If it hadn't been him, I, for him, I wouldn't be here. He was aware of the fact that during my time in the Army during the 1950s, I was posted to the Atomic Energy Commission's testing site in uh, Mercury, Nevada, and uh, where I witnessed the explosion of atomic bombs. And so he felt that it would be of interest to the people coming to this hearing to hear from somebody who actually has seen an atomic bomb explode. So before I start, I'm just wondering, is there anyone else in this room who has seen one of these things uh, actually blow up? Uh, are there any? Because I'd be very interested as to whether I have any of my cohorts here. Okay, well, it's an, uh, an astounding, awesome, scary sight to see. I saw 11 of them in uh, the spring of 1953. Uh, the background to it is that after I graduated from college in 1953, I was drafted into the Army, and uh, uh, the Korean War was on at the time, and uh, sent to the uh, uh, Signal Corps uh, photo Photography School in Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, where I was given an extensive course in photography, particularly in processing films, and then was sent to the uh, AEC's test site, and my assignment was to develop uh, what were known as film badges. Film badges were essentially... Uh, dental x-ray film that you may, may, many of you may have, have seen or used when they were used. I don't think dentists use them anymore, but you used to put them in your mouth and the x-ray machine was put up here and uh, after the x-rays went through, the doctor or the dentist could, when it was developed, the film was developed inside this, he could tell what was wrong with your tooth. Well, those same uh, gadgets were also used to tell how much radiation uh, those working at the test site received. And uh, I processed them and uh, to just wind this thing up, as a result of being there, I saw these 11 atomic bombs explode and it's uh, horrifying to see. The blast is enormous. The light would, would blind you if you weren't watching it through goggles. So I wholly endorse uh, the bills that are before the City Council here of New York uh, uh, to do everything we can to eliminate these uh, horrible weapons. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, please. Thank you. My name is Tarek Kauf. I'm a member of Veterans for Peace New York. Um, Veterans for Peace is an international organization with many uh, sister and brother chapters across the uh, globe. I'm also a member of Veterans for Peace Ireland. 
Uh, I was born in New York, I spent most of my time here, but the last year I spent mostly in Ireland, including some time in Limerick Prison. The reason I was in Ireland was similar to why I'm here today. Ireland is supposed to be a neutral country. 82% of the people in Ireland believe in neutrality and want to see neutrality. The U.S. has been violating that neutrality at Shannon Airport since 2001 and actually before that. So I was invited with some of my fellow veterans to come to Ireland to stand with the Irish people and to expose this hypocrisy that is going on by the Irish government allowing the U.S. to do that. Now, there is a connection. We have two things hanging over our head. We have the threat of nuclear war, as had been stated, and also the, th the environmental destruction, climate uh, change that's going on. Both of these things are intimately connected. And one of the things I spoke about in Ireland when I wasn't in Limerick Prison, and actually I spoke about it in Limerick Prison too because they were interested, was the connection between these two factors, these two horrible factors hanging over our head, threatening any you know, destruction to all life on Earth. I'm talking about all life on Earth. One of these bombs goes off and that's it, okay? So I so applaud what you're doing. And like I said, 82% of the Irish people are in favor of neutrality, and I will bet you that 82% at least of New Yorkers would be in favor of the initiatives that you have courageously put forward. It is so important, and I thank you so much for doing this. And as far as the, the uh, Gordian knot type of obstruction put forward before by the uh, International Affairs Committee, you know, we gotta go past that. This has to be done, this is urgent. Thank you so much. Thank you. You must have known I was chair of the Irish caucus here in the city council. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you very much to this panel. We appreciate you coming. Thank you. In. Okay, Emily McGlair, Irina Conch. I hope I said it right. I apologize if I didn't. Um, I think it's Chajila Conwall. And Chin Wai Wang. Okay, so we're calling four at a time. Ever, ever is good though, fine. Would you like to start here? Yeah. Dear council and committee members, my name is Emily McGlone, director of Peace Boat US, an organization working in collaboration with the United Nations and civil society towards peace and sustainability with a strong commitment to disarmament education. I am honored to speak to you today and share my support for these proposals to divest from and avoid any financial exposure to companies involved in the production and maintenance of nuclear weapons, reaffirming New York City as a nuclear weapon free zone and supporting the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. As an international NGO, we fully support Resolution 0976 and Introduction 1621, for it is not only a citywide declaration, but can also serve as an example for a nuclear-free world. With our office located in Manhattan, we are in favor of this nuclear disarmament legislation to let our home, New York City, shine as a role model for other major cities around the globe. Peace Boat is also a member of the International Steering Group of ICANN, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, which was awarded the 2017 Nobel Peace Prize as we saw today. We work together with the Hibakusha, atomic bomb survivors from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, on board our global voyages to raise awareness of the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons. As we know, the atomic bombings in Japan killed more than 200,000 people in 1945. Even today, the survivors continue to suffer diseases and health issues associated with exposure to ionizing radiation nearly 75 years later. Given that New York City started the nuclear age as a key node in the Manhattan Project, which developed the atomic bombs, we have a responsibility to work towards the total elimination of these weapons and to maintain our status as a nuclear weapon free zone. Together with our partners here today, we support our council members and request that you align our city's financial power with our progressive values. Thank you very much for your consideration and the opportunity to support these historic resolutions today. Dear committee, my name is Irina Chonch and I'm reading this testimony on behalf of Linda Chapman, the Associate Arti Artistic Director of New York Theatre Workshop and the founding president of Youth Arts New York. I grew up in Spokane, Washington, upwind from the Hanford nuclear plant on the Columbia River. 
I'm a two-time cancer survivor and I've always suspected that Hanford side emission leaks, long suppressed from public discussion, may have had something to do with my disease. I'm writing on behalf of passing the legis leg legislation resolution 976 on nuclear disarmament and intro 621, a bill to create a nuclear disarmament and nuclear weapon-free zone advisory committee. New York City played a major role in developing the nuclear bomb. So as progenitor and now, possible immediate target for nuclear attack, we have a special responsibility in putting a stop to the use of nuclear weapons. I came to New York City to pursue a career in the theater. New York City is the bastion of culture in US society. It is for this love and stewardship of human life itself that I want to rid the world of nuclear weapons. We must protect ourselves, nature, our theater, our music, and our art, since one nuclear bomb over New York will destroy everything and everyone we love. I would like to thank city council members for being real leaders in taking responsibility where the federal government fails, by confronting the lie and reality of nuclear weapons, one local initiative at a time. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, next please. Hello, I'm Sajila Kenwa, and I'm reading the testimony on the behalf of Yasuaki Yamashita, a survivor of Nagasaki atomic bomb. Over the course of 12 years, I have participated in an initiative called Hibuksha Stories, a program of New Youth Arts New York. I have personally interacted with tens of thousands of New York City high school students, sharing my story so that they will take leadership in ridding the world of nuclear weapons. I, Yasuaki Yamashita, was a six-year-old boy in Nagasaki when the atomic bomb fell. Normally, on a hot summer day, I would go out to the mountains with my friends of my age to catch dragonflies and cicadas. However, on this day I was playing at home nearby my mother was preparing the midday meal. Suddenly, at precisely 11.02, we were blinded with an intense light like thousands of simultaneous flashes of lightning. My mother pushed me to the ground and covered me with her body. We heard that roar of great wind and flying debris on, of the house collapsed on top of us. Then there was silence. The atomic bomb had turned the center of Nagasaki into an inferno of death and devastation. Communications and transportation were disrupted. There was no food in the city and we were starving. One week after the explosion, we walked through the rubble of the city center where fires still burned on our way to the countryside where relatives would share what little, fo little food they had. Later, I learned about the dangers of radiation that caused my father's death, and I witnessed the effects when I worked in the Nagasaki Atomic Bomb Hospital. It was very painful to see the survivors still suffering from the effects of burns and radiations. In 1968, I moved to Mexico. I have accepted many invitations to speak my about my atomic bomb experience. I feel that it's important to keep alive the memory of the suffering, devastation, and death that nuclear weapons can cause. In the hope that no one will ever use them again, I worry because each year there are fewer and fewer people still alive who can speak about this memory from personal experience. Thank you so much. Thank you very much also. Next, please. Hello, my name is Chin Wai Wong. I'm reading the testimony on behalf of Shige Kosasamori, an atomic bomb survivor from Hiroshima. Over the course of 12 years, I have participated in Hibakusha stories and interacted with thousands of New York City high school students, sharing my story so that they would take leadership in ridding the world of nuclear weapons. I was a 13-year-old student in Hiroshima, Japan, when the United States dropped the atomic bombs on my city. Hearing the sound of a plane, I looked up to see a B-29 flying overhead. Seconds later, I was knocked unconscious by the blast. When I came to, I was so badly burned that I was unrecognizable. I repeated my name and address over and over until I was finally found days later by my father. My friend, who was at my side when we looked into the sky, and many classmates who were there, died. Some of course survived, like me. One third of my body was burned. All my face, neck, back, half of my chest, shoulders, arms, and both hands. It's a miracle to me. Years later, I traveled to the United States in 1955 as part of a group of young women known as the Hiroshima Maidens. While in New York, I underwent numerous plastic surgery operations and met my adoptive father, Dr. Norman Cousins. 
I have dedicated my life to making certain no one ever experiences what I experienced and have traveled around the world telling my story and sharing my love. I have met thousands of New York City students who hugged me and gave me their love after my testimony. I love these children and it breaks my heart that anything bad would ever happen to them. New York has always been a home to me, and I'm proud that the New York City Council is providing world leadership in ridding the world of nuclear weapons. No more war, no more Hiroshima's, no more Nagasaki's. Thank you. So can I just ask, how did you get the testimony of those two uh, victims of the atomic bombing? Sure. Um, from Peace Boat US, we are in partnership with Hiboxha Stories and Youth Arts New York, and we work directly with, actually I know these survivors personally, who have traveled with us and spoken with us at many schools here in New York City. They sent us the testimonies personally. So you, you, you met them? Um, oh, yes. These are our interns and they're reading on behalf of the survivors. And you met them? I, I know them personally, yes. That's, that's really amazing. It's really important to hear that too. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. We have one last um, Yeah, testimony. I know. Is, is that... Uh, Lina Gurong? Yes. Okay, Lina. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Lina Gurung, and I'm reading this testimony on behalf of Ms. Setsuko Turlo, who is a survivor of the atomic bomb in Hiroshima and recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize in 2017 with the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. Dear council and committee members, as a 13-year-old schoolgirl, I witnessed my beloved city of Hiroshima burn in the heat of 4,000 degrees Celsius, turning into a place of desolation with heaps of rubble, skeletons, and blackened corpses everywhere. Of a population of 360,000, largely non-combatant women, children, and elderly, most became victims of the indiscriminate massacre of the atomic bombing. Even today, nearly 75 years later, people are still dying from the delayed effects of one atomic bomb, considered crude by the contemporary standards for mass destruction. Through months and years of struggle for survival, rebuilding lives out of the ashes, we survivors, or Hibakusha, became convinced that no human being should ever have to repeat our experience, and that our mission is to warn the world about the reality of the nuclear threat and to help people understand the ultimate evil of nuclear weapons. When I co-accepted the Nobel Peace Prize on behalf of the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons, I recall the words I heard when I was rescued from the rubble of a collapsed building in the ruins of Hiroshima. Don't give up, keep pushing, see the light, crawl towards it. This legislation, Resolution 976 and Intro 1621, is part of that light, the light for abolition. On behalf of the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, I would like to express my deep gratitude to all in the New York City Council who support this effort. I urge you to vote in favor of nuclear disarmament bills, to invest in New York City's future, and send a message to Washington, D.C., and the world to do the same. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to the whole panel. Thank you. All right, we're going to go to six. So, Sergeant, we're going to need two extra seats, if you can get that for us. Um, Mitchie. Taka. Okay. Good afternoon, a New York City Council members and fellow New Yorkers. My name is Michi Takeuchi. New York City has been my home for the past 40 years. This creative and energetic city has given me so much. I feel I owe it to the, this city. I owe it to share my story about my family who survived the atomic bombing in Hiroshima. My grandfather, Dr. Ken Takeuchi, was the founding president of the Red Cross Hospital in Hiroshima. On August 6, 1945, the first wartime use of an atomic bomb leveled my hometown, which had a mostly civilian population of 300,000. Although close to ground zero, the Red Cross Hospital withstood total destruction. The enormous blast caused a heavy door to fly off its hinges and knocked my grandfather unconscious. When he came to, he was unable to move 
due to broken bones all over his body. But far worse was what he saw. Unimaginable suffering, dead bodies everywhere. It was complete chaos. The A-bomb indiscriminately destroyed everyone and everything in Hiroshima. Severely burned and injured people began st uh, streaming into the hospital, desperately looking for help. The surviving doctors and nurses did the best they could with no electricity and few medical supplies. That day, it is estimated that more than 72,000 people died. By the end of 1945, that death totaled over 140,000. The nuclear weapons we have today are 3,000 times more powerful than the ones dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. If one of these modern weapons was used on New York City with eight and a half million people, it could cause a disaster of unprecedented scale and thrust the globe into an in immediate climate crisis, killing millions more people worldwide. We cannot allow the same catastrophic fate of Hiroshima and Nagasaki to befall, befall this city that we love so much. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Next, please. My name is Rosemary Pace. I'm director of Pax Christi, Metro New York, a region of the International Catholic Peace Movement. I thank you very much for this opportunity to speak in support of Intro 1621 and Resolution 976. Since I represent the Catholic Peace Movement, my testimony is rooted in Catholic social teaching. Pretty much since the development of nuclear weapons, the Catholic Church has opposed them, recognizing them to be weapons of mass destruction capable of destroying all life, all of God's creation. Just this past November, Pope Francis visited Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan, where in August 1945, the United States of America dropped the only nuclear weapons ever used in war. Much of my testimony will be the words of Pope Francis that he delivered on his historic trip. In Hiroshima, he said in part, with deep conviction, I wish once more to declare that the use of atomic energy for purposes of war is today more than ever a crime not only against dignity of human beings, but against any possible future for our common home. The use of atomic energy for purposes of war is immoral, just as the possessing of nuclear weapons is immoral. We will be judged on this. How can we speak of peace, even as we build terrifying new weapons of war? How can we speak about peace, even as we justify illegitimate actions by speeches filled with discrimination and hate? Indeed, if we really want to build a more just and secure society, we must let the weapons fall from our hands. A true peace can only be an unarmed peace. In Nagasaki, Pope Francis was even more specific. We must never grow weary of working to support the principal international legal instruments of nuclear disarmament and nonproliferation, including the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. He went on to address political leaders directly Convinced as I am that a world without nuclear weapons is possible and necessary, I ask political leaders not to forget that these weapons cannot protect us from current threats to national and international security. We need to ponder the catastrophic impact of their deployment, especially from a humanitarian and environmental standpoint, and reject heightening a climate of fear, mistrust, and hostility fomented by nuclear weapons. Pax Christi has made nuclear weapons abolition a cornerstone of its work since its beginning 75 years ago. In that context, I call on the New York City Council to pass Intro 1621 and Resolution 976. There is no time to lose. Thank you. Next, please. 
Uh, dear members of the New York City Council, uh, my name is Sally Jones. I'm the chair of Peace Action Fund of New York State, and um, I submit this testimony on behalf of Peace Action, an organization that began 57 years ago here in New York City as the Committee for a Sane Nuclear Policy. Um, we have an office just a few uh, blocks from here, Peace Action New York State, and my local chapter, Peace Action of Staten Island, is a short ferry ride across the harbor. Uh, through my involvement with Peace Action over the last 18 years, I've learned about the, how present the danger is of nuclear war, nuclear accident, and how much damage just the building of nuclear weapons is doing around the globe. This damage extends to my hometown of Staten Island, where tons of uranium were stored under the Bayonne Bridge during World War II in a site which has still not been properly remediated. We are thankful to the organizers who worked so hard to bring this legislation to you, the city council members, and made these hearings possible. Uh, I, I have a special thank you, uh, she's not here, to my own representative, council, council member Debbie Rose of Staten Island, who is a co-sponsor. Um, in three months, on April 24th and 25th, 800 Japanese, at least 800 Japanese, including survivors of August 6th and 9th of the atom bomb attacks, will be here in New York City, along with hundreds of international activists and people all around, and they'll be at Riverside Church. I want to welcome you, council members, to come to these events, and I think it would be a wonderful symbolic gesture for us to welcome the Japanese and the survivors with this legislation passed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can you get me the details? And send it to me. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, um, so thank you very much. My name is Anthony Donovan. I love sitting here and I've been, I'm looking at a great painting of George Washington and uh, how he was fought against empire and how these nuclear weapons represent exactly that, putting this gun to people's heads. So God bless you, we're gonna do our best to keep it. I gotta tell you better. something about that painting. Yes. Notice where the horse is behind is. <laughs> I'll tell you what the painter okay. thought of George Washington. Okay, all right. Great. Thank you. And, well, and, and thank you so much, uh, Councilmember Drum and, and, and Chairman Cabrera for this precious moment and for everyone sticking it out today. Um, it's very rare in our life that we get to uh, do something that can save the world. It's, I'd say it's pretty rare, right? You're doing it. Uh, you're doing it by this legislation. I want to share an experience that I had uh, four years ago when I visited, I spent a week going into the offices of our representatives of our United States. People, every member of the Armed Service Committee, every member of our Appropriations Committee, these are the people responsible for our nuclear weapons. And I found out some really disturbing things. And this is after I did this documentary, which is unfortunate, but I found out they did not have an idea of what one bomb actually does. They hadn't thought about it. So I'm really proud to be with people who think about this. It's, I'm a hospice nurse. I know what it takes to care for your mother, your child who's got cancer. I know how much energy it takes for one person. You can't even consider what this is. So they didn't know what one bomb does. The other thing is they had, these are the people responsible. Uh, they had no idea what the cost was. They didn't know, they couldn't give me a figure. Oh, it's about, so wow, okay. So and, and uh, Council Member Drum, you know that you have to be accountable and you need some transparency. You're, you're a finance chair. This is, imagine our government not knowing the cost. And uh, just, just quickly, what else I found out with them is they had no idea that uh, 155 countries at that time were gathering to talk about this because they knew the nuclear states were just going along with the status quo. And later I found out the myth that they also kicked back with, well, our allies depend on us. Our allies really need us with these nuclear weapons. Uh, 
They don't. And I've been to Scotland, where 57 out of 59 Scottish members of parliament say we want these weapons out. And I've been to Germany, where 70 to 93 percent of the citizens want our 20 nuclear bombs out of Germany. So the people are really behind you. Thank you so much. God bless you for doing this. You're a great light. Thank you very Thank much. You. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Gorbachev. I am a production designer right here in Soho. And uh, you probably guessed I am uh, related to this former Soviet Union leader, Mikhail Gorbachev. And so my father is uh, Yuri Gorbachev. He's a world famous uh, Russian artist, uh, cousin of Mikhail Gorbachev. He was good friends with Mikhail, uh, Mikhail's wife, Arisa Gorbachev. In 1988, Arisa invited my father to showcase his artwork in the Soviet Cultural Foundation, uh, as she frequently exhibited passionate artists who were against war and nuclear weapons. Uh, Raisa also was the one who encouraged my father to take his family and migrate to New York City because she knew uh, Russia would be going through difficult times. We migrated uh, from Ukraine in 1991. In 1996, the United Nations commissioned my father to create original work and to redesign the United Nations stamp. Uh, his green parrot on red flower painting is currently housed in their collection. Uh, Mikhail Gorbachev has been very proactive in downsizing the volume and availability of nuclear weapons on the international level. He holds a strong position against further development, maintain, maintenance, and expansion of all nuclear arsenals. He is convinced that it is just a matter of time bef uh, before nuclear weapons fall into their own hands and create a scenario of attack and instant retaliation. Sharing the same beliefs on this important matter, I too believe the world will greatly benefit from seizing production and elimination of all nuclear weapons. The two prominent leading nuclear countries are still Russia and the United States. Diplomatic tensions continue to escalate between the two nations. While some of the reasons are due to irrational phobias and televised propaganda, they have recently become more similar socially, economically, and politically. I strongly believe trustworthy diplomatic relations are important and necessary to de-escalate the production existence of nuclear war capabilities. There is much more to collectively benefit from having stronger relations versus being in opposition. Together, the two nations can stand together and encourage the rest of the world to denuclearize. I strongly support the TPNW and the nuclear weapons divestment. New York is one of the greatest and most influential cities on Earth, and it should stand firmly against any corporation or ties to nuclear weapons manufacturing. Every one of us can play a small part in this brave contribution and set a positive example for future generations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Thank you. Reverend? Yes. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. And uh, I'm sorry. You, you must be so tired. No time to go to the bathroom even, maybe. But <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm energized by this. I'm ready to go. Let's fight, you know? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So uh, my name is TK Nakagaki, uh, Toshikazu Kenjitsu Nakagaki. I'm the president uh, and founder of Heiwa Peace and Reconciliation Foundation of New York, and also the former president of the Buddhist Council of New York. Uh, current also is uh, vice president of the Buddhist Council of New York as well. And um, uh, also, um, I was uh, kind of recognized as a Hiroshima Peace Ambassador, as well as a Nagasaki Peace Correspondent. And uh, so I've been organizing, actually, the Hiroshima Nagasaki Memorial uh, in Manhattan uh, since I came to the New York 1994. So actually, 26 years I've been, every year, annually, uh, Co uh, hosting the interfaith peace gathering to commemorate Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And um, so that's the kind of my background. And also, in this case, I um, like to also share why I'm doing. I, I, I'm not that familiar with everything, but you know, everybody's talking about it already, so I don't have to say those things. Instead, my intention is simple. Very, you know, life is very important for everyone. Why do we need to have a weapons even, like kill anybody? And uh, especially this, this uh, nuclear weapons is too, you know, too much, really. And uh, so it, that's one of the reasons. And uh, two countries should be responsible for this particular things 
ever happened. One is Japan, because it was a country somehow, uh, uh, somehow actually, of course, there's a reason there too, but um, the atomic bomb was dropped. So that's one th country that should be. So that's, this is what my response for having the, this memorial service every time. So we try, I try to bring the awareness of the people, the importance of the peace, and the importance of all lives. And then, but the second part, the, then the other country is the United States, who use the weapons, and especially in New York, uh, you know, the Manhattan Project, many people are talking about, many uh, Manhattan Project for this uh, weapons, but yet uh, now we are actually, you know, I'm hoping always to see the Manhattan or New York or uh, United States become the responsibility, a responsible country which really maintain the peace and respecting the life. So instead of Manhattan Project for war or you know, nuclear weapons, I hope that this Manhattan Project, this is Manhattan Project for peace. And I hope you will move forward with this and uh, make the uh, US as a more responsible uh, country to, towards the, the deeds, the, you did, or we, we did too. I, probably one of the comments I just wanted to share, there's a, one thing that I stuck in my mind was, you know, if US didn't drop the bomb, maybe at that time, if the Japan has a quality too, maybe they drop too. So everybody was, you know, the kind of competing each other to try, try to win the game, but then the, that is a result here. So we need to really think of the peace as the most important things that we need to do. And then we respect each other, we try to live together, and that's the message that I'd like to share with you today. And I fully support this bill. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for coming last week to give us a little peace before our stated meeting. Thank you. Thank you to this panel. Okay. Reminded that we have to leave yes. this room at 4:30, so I don't know if that's where the next one will be our last panel. Okay. But you might want to state that we need to leave to the next room at 4:30. Okay. Okay. So I'm um, being told that we um, only have this room till 4:30, so um, that's why I'm rushing a little bit with the panels. Uh, but if we um, still have people who want to speak at 4:30, we'll go next door to hear the rest of the um, the panelists. We'll hear everybody who signed up will get an opportunity to speak. All right. Uh, Yuni Chang. And by the way, after this hearing, there is a Lunar New Year celebration in this room. So if you want to stick around for the Lunar New Year celebration, you're all welcome. Would you like to start? Dear council members and esteemed colleagues, my name is Christian Chibano. I'm a representative of the Nuko H. Peace Foundation. I'm also registered in District 4, which covers the United Nations. I hold degrees in nonproliferation and terrorism studies as well as political science. I have been a nuclear disarmament activist since 2009. I have also been on government delegations to several high-level nuclear disarmament negotiations. As an American and native New Yorker, I grew up with limited knowledge about our city's involvement in the creation of nuclear weapons, which devastated the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and ravaged the Pacific region. The devastating impact of nuclear testing in the Pacific region propelled me to act by helping the government of the Marshall Islands during the negotiations on the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, TPNW, as an advisor. We negotiated the articles related to victim assistance and environmental remediation, also known as the positive obligations of the TPNW. To educate New Yorkers, about the devastating impact of nuclear weapons, I've organized seminars at universities throughout our city. I brought high-level experts and diplomats to inform the students about the horrific impact of nuclear weapons. These young New Yorkers were able to pose questions and engage in meaningful dialogue about nuclear weapons and the TPNW with experts. Significantly, in December of 2018, I served as the official co-chair of the Global Youth Forum on the TPNW, which was held in Auckland, New Zealand. Several young New Yorkers attended the conference and engaged in dialogue with youth from both New Zealand and the Pacific region. These dialogues focus on the impact of U.S. nuclear testing in the region and the dome in the Marshall Islands where the U.S. has stored its nuclear waste from the tests. The American participants were shocked about the U.S. decision to test on the Pacific Islands and the environmental and humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons. 
As a result of this conference, many of them, especially the New York participants, vowed to remain in the field of nuclear disarmament and interact with policymakers about the importance of the treaty. One of them even inspired his friend to become an activist in the field. This young person was able to convey her own views about nuclear weapons to diplomats by drafting the youth statement for an international UN conference in October of 2019. Her views resonated with many policymakers who began to understand the importance of youth engagement. We need to continue to have these cross-cultural dialogues and engage with all young New Yorkers about the impact of nuclear weapons. In this process of educating, to continue this process of educating New Yorkers, it is imperative for all council members to support these measures. In, um, initiative Introduction 1621 and Resolution 976. These measures will help establish an advisory committee, reaffirm New York City's status as a nuclear weapon free zone, underscore its support for both ICANN City's appeal as well as the TPNW, and divest the pension fund. Together, we can establish a new peaceful period in New York and send a clear message to the entire world that New York City is committed to a world free of nuclear weapons. Thank you for your time. Thank you, too. Thank you. Next, please. John Lipsky, FBI retired, Longmont, Colorado. Honorable New York City Council members, staff, and visitors, I thank you for the opportunity to address instant introduction and resolution. Your legislation promotes world peace, and I urge you to pass it. Nuclear weapons inherently produce nuclear waste that is not protective of human health and the environment. The United States is comprised of nuclear state-created dangers and cover-ups of weapons-grade plutonium-239 manufacturing, waste, and unfulfilled remediation. Plutonium-239, among many other nuclear weapon chemicals, is primarily anthropogenic, with a half-life of over 24,000 years and capable of aberrations of human cells. One such nuclear Superfund site is the former Rocky Flats Nuclear Weapons Plant, Denver, or Golden, Colorado. I was the principal FBI agent who investigated crimes at Rocky Flats where plutonium pit, pit production ceased that resulted in federal criminal convictions. In 1989, the Rocky Flats contract operator sued the federal government in part because, quote, compliance with the land disposal restrictions is currently impossible, unquote. Thirty years after Rocky Flats, proliferation of nuclear weapons is frightfully increasing. Despite the lack of nuclear repository facilities in the United States, the National Nuclear Safety Administration, or Security Administration, NNSA, is forcing its plan to produce 80 weapons-grade plutonium-239 pits per year by 2030 at a cost of exceeding $1 trillion. And that's going to be at Los Alamos, New Mexico, and the Savannah River site, South Carolina. The NNSA plan, unfortunately, is more nuclear Superfund sites instead of infrastructure projects completed. Misguided temporary nuclear waste storage sites instead of affordable housing, and more citizens forced to live with radiation instead of affordable health care plans. Health and safety will be pretermited, as it has in the past. I know because I investigated it with nuclear weapons and its veil of secrecy. As President Obama remarked in 2009, the peace and security of a world without nuclear weapons, unquote. Nuclear waste is not your friend. Thank you. Imagine what we could do with a trillion dollars. It'd be fun. Right. Next, please. Thank you, Council. My name is Donna Stein. I'm a member of the board of directors of Hudson River Sloop Clearwater and president of New York City Friends of Clearwater, both founded by Pete Seeger 50 years ago to clean up the environmental disaster that was the Hudson River. There was much success, but the river still needs our attention. Clearwater has long opposed and exposed the risks of nuclear power. Focus has been on the dangers of nuclear plants and the use of nuclear energy, but make no mistake, there is a direct connection between nuclear weapons and nuclear energy and its result in nuclear waste. Nuclear is not just about the plant, the bomb. There are so many things up to that point. 
uranium mining, milling, and weapons testing impacts communities around this country and the world, including First Nation communities with proposed waste storage on their lands. Pete Seeger, back in 1963, sang a song, Never Again the A-Bomb. Look it up. He said, we must forbid it. Take care that the third atom bomb never falls. Sadly, testing continues, even past the times we were told it had stopped, and nuclear weapons arsenals in several countries remain deeply troubling. History demonstrates that plans were, made for, were mainly for the purpose to create material for nuclear bombs. There are much better, safer ways to boil water. Bob Alpern, an, an anti-nuclear activist and fellow Clearwater board director, often calls Indian Point a pre-positioned nuclear weapon. So many things could go wrong. It sits too close to a high-pressure gas pipeline managed by a company who has pipeline accidents. It also sits on a seismic fault line, which was unknown to the builders when it was originally cited. Terrorists have included Indian Point as a possible target. Please put a halt to this madness and don't make public employees have to be a party to this horror. I urge you to divest from nuclear weapons, make history, attend to your legacy, and pass this resolution. It's a start. Thank you for your understanding of this important issue. Thank you. Next, please. Okay. My name is Bill Offenlock, and I'm here to read a statement on behalf of Father Steve Kelly, whom you heard about earlier. He's been in prison now almost two years in Georgia for a plowshares action and has served over 10 years in prison for similar actions. He writes, I write regarding these resolutions worthy of your agenda and affecting New York City citizens and millions of other vulnerable people. I am currently a prisoner of conscience in Brunswick, Georgia, as a consequence of a witness an embodiment of the vision of economic, political, and moral conversion given us in Isaiah, swords into plowshares. This nonviolent exposure of the omnicide of the trident offense system underlines your concerns of the danger of nuclear possession, threat, and God forbid, use. But more importantly, and several Catholic workers and others will speak to this, it is trillions of dollars in theft from the needs of our society, as outlined by Eisenhower in his Presidential Departure Declaration. I am encouraged that you consider divestment and advocacy of the ICANN Treaty. Nuclear weapons will not go away by themselves. Thank you very much. Next, please. Hello, uh, my name is Yuni Chang and I'm the field organizer with the War Resisters League and we are the oldest secular anti-war organization in the US. I was born on August 13th, 1996 in Seoul, South Korea and I've lived on the East Coast for 22 years. This country has been at war for 80% of my life. The war my grandparents lived through and that my parents were born in, the one that killed three million Koreans, separated my family and remains one of the bloodiest wars in history is still not over. This year is the 70th anniversary of that war. Nuclear weapons are tools of endless war. They were designed to wipe out human life and to destroy the world many times over. Therefore, War Resisters League supports these proposals and we commend you for standing up to the grave threat of nuclear warfare. However, in our 96 years of organizing against war, we know that the only way to truly eliminate the threats posed by nuclear weapons is to end all wars. And the only way to end all wars is to address their root causes, which include racism, sexism, and all forms of exploitation. These root causes threaten humanity's common desire to live well and without fear, and we see them at play in the daily lives of all New Yorkers. We see the root causes of war thriving in a city that chooses to spend billions on building new jails and on cracking down on fare evasion instead of on NYCHA, harm reduction programs, and poverty benefits. 
the systems that wage war across the world, and the systems that police, harass, surveil, and detain people in our city are the same. If you support divesting from nuclear weapons and reaffirming New York City as a nuclear-free zone for the well-being and future of humanity, then you cannot simultaneously fund and advocate for projects that criminalize people for being black, brown, queer, and trans, and poor. You have to fight for people's lives in every arena. As a city council, it is your responsibility to vote consistently for the safety and dignity of New Yorkers and those with whom we share this earth. We celebrate that a veto-proof majority supports this powerful and needed legislation, and we urge you to be brave and take a stand against violence in all its forms. Thank you very much. Leslie. <clears throat> thank you. Um, hi. Um, first of all, thank you to to the uh, council members who, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble with my voice today, but thank you to the council members who are uh, taking your role on the city council seriously and giving us all the leadership uh, on this issue. Uh, my name is Les Kagan. Uh, I'm a decades-long organizer in the peace and justice movements. Uh, and in fact, 38 years ago, I was the lead organizer of the historic uh, nuclear disarmament protests on June 12th, 1982, here in New York City. Um, a few hours ago, I sat here, as I think many in the room, in uh, disbelief, horrified, and outraged by the comments from the mayor's office. Um, I urge you uh, and your uh, comrades on the city council to respond to those comments by quickly, very quickly, passing 976 and 1621. <clears throat> For decades, the people of the city have petitioned, lobbied, marched, rallied, and engaged in civil disobedience as part of the global movement to rid the world of the most horrific weapons ever produced, nuclear weapons. We should be proud of this history, but our work is far from over. Today, the world faces two great existential threats, the nightmare of a global climate crisis unfolding faster and more intensely than previously predicted, and the ever-present threat of the use of nuclear weapons, either by accident or design. Nine nations have nuclear weapons, um, <clears throat> some of the biggest nations in the world. So one might ask, what is the point of New York City passing 976 and 1621? The point is this, each of us as citizens of the world must find and use every single tool available to bring us, that is the planet, back from the edge of disaster. There is no time to waste. Our opinions matter, but our opinions matter, but most critically, our actions are what is most important. The city of New York has the opportunity to help strengthen the, the global movement to rid the world of nuclear weapons. We urge you to use the power of your office to take the concrete steps by enacting 976 and 1621 and to do so without further delay. Quite literally, the clock is ticking. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very powerful. Thank you to this panel. And we're going to call up one more panel and see if we can then move over to the next room. But let me get this panel up here now. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak, Council people. I'm very honored to be here and I am going to speak um, very quickly and to, to because I know we don't have much time. I come as a representative of a group called Women Strike for Peace. This was a group of women who in the 1960s, the early 60s, fought on behalf of their children and the children of the United States because fallout from nuclear bomb testing in the Nevada desert had spread across the U.S. and scientists found the strontium-90 from this fallout in baby teeth gathered from all over the United States. And did my you mother say, did was. Did you say your name? My name is Heidi Hutner. Okay. I'm a professor at Stony Brook University. 
I'm a writer and I'm actually making a documentary film right now about women and nuclear disasters. So these women, one of my mother was one of them, and this group was founded by Bella Abzug and Dagmar Wilson. These women, 50,000 of them, organized. It was the largest group at the time that had organized in the United States, and they protested, and they convinced President Kennedy to sign the Limited Test Ban Treaty, and they stopped atmospheric bomb testing, or at least they greatly influenced this treaty. So I'm here on behalf of those women and on behalf of the women and indigenous people across the world who actually are most harmed by nuclear disasters, by radiation waste. One of the facts in the preamble to this treaty that we spoke about today that these wonderful people won a Nobel Peace, Peace Prize for speaks to the gender issues. Women are twice as likely to get cancer from the same exposure to radiation as adult men and they are nearly twice as likely to die from that exposure. Children many, many times more so, and little girls most of all are harmed, seven times more so than adult white males. But radiation standards, safety standards, are based on an adult male body. So this is an important fact. Indigenous people we know are most exposed because they are in communities where uranium mining takes place, and we also know that their communities have been very much affected by nuclear bombs. These facts are often ignored, and these communities and these people are most harmed. So I speak on behalf of them and on behalf of the children, and I ask that you humbly pass this resolution and work hard, and I thank you so much for your work. Thank, thank you. Next, please. Hello, my name is Lily Adams. I work with the Union of Concerned Scientists, or UCS, a nonprofit organization dedicated to using rigorous, independent science to solve our planet's most pressing problems, including the threat of nuclear weapons. I would like to thank the New York City Council members today for considering this urgent and important issue. As an organization of scientists, UCS must reckon with the fact that scientists help bring about the development of nuclear weapons. Yet after the creation of the bomb and its tragic use in New Mexico and Japan, the very same scientists were some of the most ardent advocates for disarmament and the prevention of their use ever again. UCS works to continue that legacy of science advocacy. As others have said, last week the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists set their doomsday clock to just 100 seconds to midnight, citing unprecedented nuclear threats and calling on the world to take immediate action. Despite these dire warnings, our federal government is neglecting its responsibility to act, and in some cases is actively making the world less safe by promoting dangerous nuclear weapons policies. This is why UCS believes it is crucial for local governments to take a stand. We urgently need local elected officials and concerned advocates to raise their voices and denounce these terrible, inhumane weapons. This action is especially powerful coming from New York City, the birthplace of the Manhattan Project and home to many former nuclear weapons sites. New York City has a stake in this fight. And as a New York City resident myself, I am proud to be here today as part of this historic effort and to support the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. The Union of Concerned Scientists wholeheartedly supports New York City in divesting from the companies involved in the production and maintenance of nuclear weapons, and we urge New York City Council to support Resolution 976 and Introduction 1621 to help create a safer world. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Hello, my name is Timon Wallace. I'm representing Nuclear Ban US and the Acronym Institute for Disarmament Diplomacy. And I've um, given you two um, background documents. One is called Warheads to Windmills, which is a report about the links between climate change and nuclear weapons, and demonstrates not only the links between these two, but the fact that we can't address climate change without addressing nuclear weapons. And we need the money, we need the scientists and the, and the engineers, and we need the international goodwill that is being squandered by these weapons. So, New York is already in the lead on the fossil fuels, and um, so that's why I hope we can um, add that to the, to the nuclear issue. The other uh, document that I've given you is just a very brief summary of research I did back in the 1990s uh, about the uh, peace movement in the 80s that led to the INF Treaty and to the largest um, 
disarmament process that we've seen so far, um, including as we many people here were part of the the, the uh, nuclear freeze movement, the million people marching in the streets of uh, New York, and so on. And my research was looking at what ultimately affected the Reagan administration to reverse course from uh, calling the the Soviet, you know, the evil empire into being uh, willing to, to sign the, the, the most comprehensive treaty that was ever signed up to that point. And it was about pressure on these companies. It was about divestment campaigns and boycotts. It was about cities like Chicago and Oakland, California, refusing to uh, have contracts with these companies as well as divesting. And so I think we need to remember this legacy when you're looking at divestment and how important it is. It was, it was important in many other issues as well as in the nuclear issue back in the 1980s. So thank you. Hey, thank you. Next, please. My name is Vicki Elson, Executive Director of the Treaty Awareness Campaign. Um, like many of the people in this room, part of our work as members of ICANN, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, is to visit the UN missions here in New York City. So I want to tell you a little story. One day, as we were visiting the UN mission of Antigua Barbuda, uh, we were talking about the 122 countries that adopted the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. We were talking about the countries that have already signed and ratified it. We were talking about ICANN's Nobel Peace Prize. We were asking how we can support Antigua Barbuda to get going and sign this treaty sooner rather than later. And they were saying, yes, we're going to sign the treaty, but it's going to take a while, lots of red tape. And then we started telling them about what's happening here in the U.S., what the people in this room are doing all over the country, working with faith organizations, um, schools, universities, banks, hospitals, cities, counties, states, and the U.S. Congress to bring an end to the 75-year nightmare of nuclear weapons. So I was talking about what we're doing here in this country, and I watched this person's face change. And she said, you know what? I'm going to light some fires under some people today. And I'm happy to report that Antigua Barbuda has since signed and ratified the treaty. I don't take personal credit for it. <laughs> uh, what we do here in the US and what happens in New York City has an impact. It tells the rest of the world that there are strong currents here in solidarity on this issue. We look forward to the day sooner or later when US policy will change to reflect the fact that nuclear weapons of mass extinction are obsolete and indescribably dangerous, sucking trillions of dollars and our best scientists away from the green technologies we need to survive the climate emergency. Here in the Big Apple, you have an opportunity to accelerate the transformation of warheads to windmills. You've already voted to divest from fossil fuels, a magnificent step toward being on the right side of history, survival, and sanity. Thank you so much for your beautiful efforts to do the same with nuclear weapons. I have to tell you, this work is tiring. Anybody know what I mean? Like, it's hard. It's like pushing a big radioactive rock up a hill or something, you know? And today, I feel so encouraged, the stuff with the mayor's office notwithstanding, I feel so delighted and refreshed to be here. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. My name is Alfred Meyer, and I'm a board member of Physicians for Social Responsibility, an organization which has worked on nuclear issues since uh, 1963 and the issue of atmospheric nuclear testing. It's a great pleasure to be here, and I appreciate this opportunity. Dear council and committee members, nuclear weapons threaten in an instant to vaporize all that we love in New York City. We must act to end this grave danger to our survival. Resolution 976 and Introduction 1621 are two important steps that New York City can take to protect and promote public health and safety. Thank you for moving these two items, which show strong support for City Council action on such an important topic. Cities are the targets of nuclear weapons, and cities are the first responders to an attack. From a medical perspective, there is no response possible given that the medical providers, medical facilities, and medical supplies are destroyed by a nuclear blast. Prevention is the only medical response to this threat. 
Resolution 976 and introduction 1621 are two good methods of prevention, which will benefit New York City residents. New York City can play an important part in the growing cities, states, national, and international movement to get countries to sign and ratify the 2017 United Nations Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Divestment of New York City investments from nuclear weapons related corporations and banks is a strong statement of the seriousness of this topic and a moral statement that we don't want our pensioners benefits to come from nuclear weapons which could destroy us. When a nation possesses nuclear weapons, it harms its own population at many steps of the nuclear fuel and weapons chain, a complex and very large industry. As noted in the Treaty for the Pro Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, women and children are most impacted by exposure to radiation. So this matter is urgent for us to address, although it will take time to make the changes needed to achieve a nuclear weapons free world. The wise leadership and support for Resolution 976 and Introduction 1621 to date is most appreciated. I trust that ongoing and attentive engagement by the City Council will support achievement of these important missions, which in turn benefit us all. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Chuck Johnson, Charles K. Johnson, uh, Director program director of International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. Um, thank you, uh, co-chairs and council members for having us. I'm honored to have the opportunity to speak to you today and wish to thank the New York City Council for having the foresight to consider these two measures, which taken together would be the strongest statement yet by a U.S. municipality in favor of global sanity in the face of the continued and renewed threat to global survival posed by nuclear weapons and war. It's apropos that the International City of New York would lead the way toward reconsidering our nation's reliance on the judgment and actions of a few flawed and fragile individuals to prevent a nuclear catastrophe, or as our president put it, fire and fury like the world has never seen. International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War is a federation consisting of 63 national affiliates worldwide that have studied the effects of a single atomic bomb and of nuclear war at various levels of severity. In all cases, we find there is no adequate medical response to the use of nuclear weapons, which destroys medical and other infrastructure, as Alfred just said, and wounds and kills the professionals who would ordinarily provide aid to the sick and wounded. Consequently, we concluded, as our founding organization, Physicians for Social Responsibility in the U.S. originally said, that prevention is the only cure and the only responsible medical position to take on the subject. You've received in your packets three statements from physicians representing IPPNW, our co-president Tillman Ruff on the faculty of the University of Melbourne on Australia and a co-founder of ICANN. Co-President Ira Helfand, practicing physician in Northampton, Mass, and IPPNW German, Germany representative Inga Blum, a physician in Hamburg, Germany. In addition, I'm attaching to the end of my testimony the statement of IPPNW, the World Medical Association, the International Council of Nurses, and the World Federation of Public Health Associations in strong support of the 2017 UN Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Working together with the International Committee for the Red Cross, we are actively encouraging all levels of government to support the Nuclear Ban Treaty in any way they can, and we thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your time, and thank you for coming in and giving testimony. Uh, we appreciate that. And what we think we're going to do now is move in next door. You're ready for us there? Okay, so for those of you who want to come in, come in, please. Uh, and we'll continue the hearing in that room.